Ladies and gentlemen, announcing the arrival of Yang Berbahagia of Vice Technologies Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Sarifan, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academy and International, accompanied by members of Faculty Management to the inaugural lecture of mechanization technology infusion in crop production for Q and Q. Ladies and gentlemen, our national anthem, Negaraku and Putra Gemilang. Ladies and gentlemen, you may now be seated.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh and good morning. Our distinguished guest of honor yang berbahagia, Professor Technologist Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Saripan, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academy and International, Representative Vice Chancellor of University Putra Malaysia. Our gracious host yang berbahagia, Professor Insinyur Teknologis Dr. Nur Kamariah Nordin, Dean of Engineering Faculty. Our honoured speaker yang berbahagia, Professor Insinyur Dr. Azmi bin Yahya, Lecturer of the Bi Biological and Agriculture Engineer Engineering Department who will be presenting his inaugural lecture for today. Members of our University Management, Tan Sri Tan Sri, Puan Sri Puan Sri, Datuk Datuk, Datin Datin, Distinguished Guests, Family Members of our Speaker, Ladies and Gentlemen. To begin with, I would like to invite Ustaz Muhammad Hafiz Ghazali from Islamic Centre UPM to recite the du'a. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إلى الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي للجلال وجهك الكريم وعظيم سلطانك اللهم أحينا بالإيمان وأمسنا بالإيمان وحشرنا بالإيمان وأدخلنا الجنة مع الإيمان برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم يا رحمن رحيم يا الله كود أجون كان لسان جون لم يبنه كرحمة كدولة المود جون جون في سامping تدا يعم برحة في سبح كجلين كاو يا الله بحواسنا سجلا سانجون dan pujian hanyalah untukmu kami menjunjung dan mujimu dan kami mohon kepadamu pertolongan dan keampunan hanya kepada kami mohon perlindungan daripada kejahatan dan kesilapan kami. Allahumma ya mujibu da'was. Kami bersyukur kepadamu kerana sifat rahman rahimu. Dapat kami berkumpul pada hari ini untuk majlis yang berkat ini. Sempena majlis syarahan inaugural Profesor Insinia Dr. Azmi bin Yahya. Allahumma ya mujibu da'was wa ya qadhi al-hajat. Bantulah kami dalam usaha kami semua untuk menjadi institusi peneraju dalam penyelidikan dan pembelajaran. Serta sebagai sebuah universiti tersohor. Tolonglah kami meningkatkan usaha kami untuk mencari ilmu dan penemuan-penemuan baru sebagai suatu inisiatif. Ia akan membawa faedah kepada agama negara dan juga rakyat. Allahumma ya Rahman ya Karim Kami akur bahawa ilmu pengetahuan adalah amalahmu yang mesti dijana Selari dengan petunjukmu untuk manfaat manusia Anggaplah pencarian ilmu dan usaha kami mengintegrasikan sumber-sumber ilmu wahyu Dengan sains sosial, kemanusiaan, sains dan teknologi sebagai satu ibadah Demi pembangunan dan pengayaan tradisi intelektual kami dan kemajuan Islam dan juga negara Allahumma ya qahar Anugerahkanlah bantuanmu agar kami dapat memperoleh semula keagungan Dan kegemilangan intelektual kecendekawanan serta ketamulunan Islam Allahumma rabbana zalamna anfusana wa illam taghfil lana wa tarhamna lana kunan minal khasirin Allahumma rabbana taqabbal minna du'aana innaka antas sami'ul alim Wa atub alayna ya maulana innaka antas thawab rahim دعواهم فيها سبحانك اللهم وتحياتهم فيها سلام وآخر دعواهم أن الحمد لله رب العالمين. آمين آمين يا رب العالمين. Thank you for the recitation. Ladies and gentlemen, let us use this opportunity to thank the mighty Allah for His blessing that we are able to be here today. It is hoped that through this event, we will, we will able to get to know one another in a much better way, gaining more experiences and last but not least, to develop a strong networking relationship among us. Without further ado, I would like to invite our most distinguished guest of honour, Yang Berbahagia, Professor Technologist Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Saripan, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academy and International, to chair the event. Please give a warm round of applause.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. And uh, very good morning to all of you. Um, yang bahagia Profesor Dr. Nokam Maria Hanudin, Dean Fakulti of Engineering University Putra Malaysia. Yang bahagia Profesor Engineer Dr. Azmi Yahya, our VIP today, um, who's going to present his inaugural lecture. Senior officers of University Putra Malaysia, management members of Faculty of Engineering, invited guests from the industries agencies, and uh, uh, good to see some of our former lecturers as well, professors as well at engineering. Thanks for coming. Uh, family members of our inaugural speaker, UPM staff and students, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first, of, first of all, I would like to convey regards from Yang Bahagia Datin Paduka, Vice Chancellor. Uh, she's now in overseas. Um, but um, I'm very honoured to chair this inaugural lecture, um, and I've got my um, my um, personal reasons as well. Uh, number one, the last time I was standing here was for my inaugural lecture. So uh, this is right after my inaugural lecture. Um, but what's more important is that uh, I got my professorship when. Uh, uh, Prof. Azmi was the dean, so uh, he has been grooming me, and uh, I was the deputy dean at Faculty of Engineering when he was the dean as well, uh, and then uh, he has taught me a lot, and uh, I was the director of Center of Quality Assurance when he was the dean as well. So thank you very much, Prof. Professor Engineer Dr. Azmi Yahya was born in Kuala Terengganu um, into a family of seven members. He completed his primary and secondary school in Kuala Terengganu and uh, upon completing his uh, Malaysian Certificate of Education, SPM, or supposed to be MCE, I think, yeah, Malaysian Certificate of Education, he enrolled in a Diploma of Science and uh, after that he obtained his Bachelor of Engineering Agriculture at University Pertanian Malaysia uh, that time, um, and currently known as UPM, University Putra Malaysia. He started his career as a tutor at the Faculty of Agriculture Engineering, which is now currently known as our Faculty of Engineering, before pursuing his graduate studies at Iowa State uh, University, USA. He received his Master's of Science in Agriculture Engineering in 1985, and a PhD in Agriculture Engineering with minor in Engineering Science and Mechanics, three years later, at the age of 28. Upon returning to UPM, he was appointed as a lecturer at the Department of Power and Machinery Engineering in the Faculty of Agriculture Engineering. He was the first engineering graduate of UPM to acquire a PhD degree in engineering and among few local lecturers in the faculty during that time with a PhD degree. His first responsibility in the department was to lead the research area in agriculture machinery engineering and to establish the new agriculture machine design laboratory in the department. In UPM, he had served as the head of Department of Power and Machinery Engineering and then the head of the department for the Department of Biological and Agriculture Engineering in the Faculty of Engineering, Deputy Dean Research for the Faculty of Engineering and uh, as the Dean of Faculty of Engineering over two different appointment terms. He is the person responsible for introducing the new Bachelor of Engineering, Biosystems and Agriculture to replace the old Bachelor of Engineering Agriculture curriculum in UPM. Furthermore, he also initiated the development of the new Department of Biological and Agriculture Engineering at the Faculty of Engineering as what we see today. Engineer Dr. Azmi's research area is mainly focused on the design and development of field machineries for all palm and wetland rice agriculture mechanization and automation programs in Malaysia. He managed to secure as the principal investigator a total of more than 6 million ringgit grants, uh, external grants for UPM. And until now has a total of 10 PhD students and 12 masters by research students have graduated under uh, his supervision. He has a collection of more than 200 scientific publications, uh, one internationally published technical book, seven granted patents, 
and six products as well as innovation awards at the international exhibition. One of his high impact research involvement is in the setting of standards of operation procedure in flying unmanned aerial systems, UAS, for agriculture chemical spraying and formulating the special chemicals for UAS spraying in wetland rice fields. He and his research team are now in the process of setting up a standard testing facility for UAS aerial agriculture liquid chemical spraying and granular fertilizer spreading operations. In recognition for his research excellence at UPM, he was awarded the Vice Chancellor, Vice -Chancellor Fellowship Award by UPM in 2004. The American Society of Agriculture Engineers had awarded him the AE50 Outstanding Innovations in Product or System Technology for three outstanding technological innovations in agriculture in the year of 2002, 2003 and 2004. Engineer Dr. Azmi has received both national and international recognitions based on his expertise, experience and professional leadership. He has been regularly invited to give talks and lectures on topics related to his expertise in the area in Malaysia and also to give keynote presentations at major international agriculture engineering conferences in overseas like in Japan, China, Indonesia, Philippines, Korea, etc. Besides that, he has occasionally been called to sit in a national level committees related to agriculture mechanization activities or programs and on a very regular basis elected as referee for scientific articles in the area. Currently, he sits on editorial boards of three established international journal in the field of agriculture engineering. He had been the chairman of the organizing committee for a number of international and national conferences that were held in Malaysia. He has been an advisory member of the National Oil Palm Industry Mechanization Committee since 2000. He was the former research board advisory member for Felda Global Ventures R&D, former executive committee member in the Mechanization, Automation and Agro-Industry Strategic Trust Corporate Plan for Malaysian Farmers Association Board, LPP, and frequent panel evaluator for Science Innovation and Technology Research Grant from Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation, uh, National Innovation uh, Malaysia, MOSTI, and Minister of Education, MOE. He was the recipient of the JICA Award for a three-month agriculture machinery testing and evaluation course at Bio-Oriented Technology Research Advancement Institute, OMIA, Japan, in 1992, and the uh, Mi University UNLRD Award for a three-month research scholar attachment at Mi University, for the Renewable Energy Projects in 1996. In 2013, he was selected to be among the top 20 qualified individuals around the world to participate in the CIRG's Next Leaders in Agriculture Machinery Assembly event that was organized by the International Commission of Agriculture and Biosystem Engineering in Germany. In the same year, in honor of his long involvement and prominence in the area of agriculture machinery engineering, at national and regional levels, he was honored to become a member by invitation in the Club of Bologna. Recently in 2018, the College of Engineering at Iowa State University honored him at a very special alumni event in the campus with the Professional Achievement Citation in Engineering or PACE Award, PACE Award. And this is for his contribution achievements in the professional services. He was the first recipient outside USA to be given such recognition by the College of Engineering at Iowa State University. <laughs> Engineer Dr. Azmi has been the Executive Secretary and Vice President for the Malaysian Society of Agriculture Engineers, MSAE, and the Honorable Secretary for the Agriculture and Food Engineering Technical Division, Institution of Engineers Malaysia, AFETDIEM. He was the former advisor for MSAE and he had played a very active role in uplifting the name of the society and the agriculture engineering profession in general at national and international levels. He is also a registered professional engineer with the Malaysian Board of Engineers, Malaysia, BEM, and a fellow member of MSAE. 
member of the Incorporated Society of Planters, ISP, Asian Association of Agriculture Engineering, American Society of Agriculture and Biological Engineers, and International Society of Precision Agriculture. Ladies and gentlemen, throughout his 37 excellent years with UPM, Professor Engineer Dr. Azmi Yahya has actively and significantly contributed to the curriculum, research and professional development of agriculture engineering discipline in Malaysia as written in his inaugural book. Without any further delay, let us now listen to Yang Bahagia Professor Engineer Azmi bin Yahya's inaugural lecture entitled Mechanization Technology Infusion in Crop Production for Q and Q. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum. Very good morning to everybody. Uh, well, before I start my lecture, let me give a short uh, speech. Okay. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very pleasant Friday morning. I bid to all. UPM Top Management Officer, Learned Professors, Industrial Players, and my fellow colleagues. Before I start my 60-minute presentation with my lengthy lecture, hopefully not, I think it is best for me to start off by expressing my appreciation to those who have played a vital role in making today's happen. Firstly, to UPM respectful Yang Babahagia Professor Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Saripan, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic and International. Despite having so much on his plate at the moment and packed pack schedule, I'm truly touched for his presence to chair this event and to make time witnessing the day of mine. You have just made today a very memorable one for me. Thank you very much. I am beyond thankful to the Faculty of Engineering Dean, my head department, and the rest of management team for making this event possible and for providing all the support needed. Not to forget to the staff of Vice Chancellor Office, the Faculty of Engineering, and the Biological and Agriculture Department for their earnest hard work for the past few months for planning and preparing of this whole special inaugural lecture event. I'm also like to express heartfelt appreciation to my fellow guests from DOA, MPOB, Marudi, LPP, Felda, Semdabi, companies, and many others for realizing the goals of my research. The journey of completing all the research would not be as smooth sailing as they have been without your shared interest and cooperation in realizing this goal. Thank you very much. To my dearest friend, whom friendship has been established for more than 35 years, and also to those whom I just recently made friends with, thank you for all the moments we have cherished all these years through casual jokes shared over meal, knowledge shared between intellectual discourses, and for backing me up for all these years, offering hand to get me back on the feet when unforeseen event hit me. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Last but not least, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, the Creator, Shukul alhamdulillah, for the knowledge and blessing He has showered me with all this year, humbled by the knowledge He has lent to me, I hope for nothing 
but for it to be benefited by mankind. And in the path that pleased my Creator here and also after life. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Well, uh, let's start with my lecture. It's a bit unusual for me to have a lecture with my bosses around to listen to my, uh, to my lecture. Okay. The title of my presentation is Mechanization Technology Infusion in Crop Production for Q&Q. &Q. A lot of people ask me what Q&Q &Q stands for. Okay. Q is quality and the other Q is quantity. So it's for quality and quantity. Well, to most of us, when they say quantity and quality in crop production, it refers to the yield, the amount of yield, and the quality of the yield. Okay? But to me, as an engineer, I'm looking that at different perspective. It will be more on the production, on the operation of Q and Q. So to me, Q, as an engineer, refers to the quality with respect to field capacity. Okay? We are talking about hectares per acre okay, in our operation. Whereas the other Q stands for quality, we are talking about the precision, precisionness of the operation. Meaning to say, if you are doing spraying operation in a field, what we want, we want to have the capacity, okay, the hectares per hour, when we are using our machinery in the field, and then at the same time, when you talk about quality, the quality of spray, the penetration of the spray, the coverage of the spray, the drift, and plus other things. So that is Q&Q &Q that I'm going to present today in my lecture. Okay, uh, first of all, the content of the lecture is not through my own work solely, but of course, with the help of the pool of my graduate students that has been with me working very hard since I started my career as a lecturer. So I have this long list of PhD students, some of them are uh, uh, associate and some are professors, and I lose touch, touch of them too. And then, with my master student that I have, okay, a list also of my master student, and then finally, of course, to my dedicated technical staff in my lab. Okay, it started with Haji Muhammad Isan, who is with me in 1988 till 1992. Then Haji Saufi Abdul, uh, Ab Abdul Saufi Abdul Kadeh, 1992 to 1996. And finally, Muhammad Rushdi Zamri from 1996 until today. And thank you very much for your help. Okay, uh, let me go to the definition first. What is agriculture mechanization? Okay. It is not only the use of machine. A lot of us, when they refer agriculture mechanization, they refer with the use of machine or implement. Remember that the use of hand tool is also referred to agriculture mechanization, but it only has a different degree of mechanization imposed. Okay? Meaning to say that it is slightly in the lower degree. And then the discipline of agriculture Mechanization, it includes design, development, manufacturing, distribution, management, and utilization. To the government uh, officers, uh, whenever they want to embark on agriculture mechanization programs in the country, don't just look on the utilization of the machinery. Please, the scope of agriculture mechanization covers design, covers development, covers manufacturing, and covers distribution of the machinery. That is the whole scope of agriculture mechanization. And without this com complete scope, I don't think that we are able to mechanize our agriculture production as what other de developing countries has been. Okay, 
benefit of agriculture mechanization. I have a long list of benefit of agriculture mechanization, but I want to highlight one important, important benefit that people forget about that. Number five, improving field working condition and make more attractive for people to involve in agriculture. A lot of us forget about this important benefit of agriculture mechanization. Okay? Uh, we have comment from the government saying that our people are lazy in working in agriculture. Okay? I think that is not a good comment. Well, to me, I say personally, because first of all, let us look at the condition of our agriculture. Okay? It is not attractive enough for people to work. If they have other options, they won't work in agriculture. Okay? In fact, personally, I won't allow my children to work in agriculture with the current agriculture condition in the country. Okay? So it's high time for us to change that. And to change that, we have to mechanize our agriculture production in our country and let people to come and work. Well, we don't expect that our PD farmers or our oil palm smallholders to let their son to work in the paddy field or in the plantation. You know or not, most of their farm, most of their son and daughter are all educated now. Some of them are professional. In fact, in this hall, there are a few who are already professors now. And they are from oil palm smallholders you know. And you can imagine, I'm sure that they don't want to work in agriculture. Because, okay, they, won't, they, don't, they don't want to work in agriculture. So, uh, Let's change the scenario, make people attractive to work, okay? And then at the same time, let investors to invest on that, okay? On our agri agriculture. Okay, uh, I want to highlight also this uh, record of achieve ach achievement, okay? On agriculture mechanization, okay? By the American National Academy of Engineering, it says that okay, 20 of the great achievement of the 20th century, number seven is agriculture mechanization. And you can see their ranking. It's higher than highway, it's higher than spacecraft, it's higher than internet. Okay? So what is the success story of this achievement? One good example, if you look at US agriculture, at the start of 20th century, we have four farmers to feed 10 people. But at the end of the 20th century, we have one farmers that can feed 1,000 people. And now US, not only able to produce enough food to feed the countries or the population, but has excess grain for export. Okay, the evolution of agriculture, way back started, I think, when uh, people start to plant, okay, and uh, sort of uh, for food, okay, where it started with small farm, then the farm get larger, okay, and when the farm get larger, they start to use machinery, okay, where machinery are mostly mechanical based to vary treatment between field. But nowadays, the field are getting bigger, but they are using machineries with electronic base. And then trying to vary the pre treatment within field, not between field, within field, so that they can have yield. So that is the evaluation of agriculture that has been going on in the world. Okay, and uh, let me uh, give a brief uh, view of the mechanization status based on the crop classification by FAO. These are the work done by one of my PhD students. 
who did a review paper, okay, based on, uh, I think, more than 200 papers, and we have published that in an energy journal. I think it's a good work, and people, a lot of people refer to this paper. So we, we would like to see the scenario of mechanization status based on what we calculated is the mechanization index. Okay. These are the average value that we have. Okay. Okay, you can see that the status of mechanization currently in the world is from 0 0.18 until 0 0.77, meaning to say that it's widespread and there is a lot more that we can do. These are only average value, you know, whereas to some countries, there are countries that have reached 100% for that particular crop. So the highest mechanization index is cereal. When we say cereal, is rice, wheat, barley, and plus others. It's about 0 0.77. And then the lowest is beverages and spice. Okay? And of course, you can see the distribution that we have. Okay? This is just a comparison that we want to make to what we have achieved in Malaysia. So we also make a study on the status of mechanization in Malaysia. Okay? We, we have about, I think, 200 plots that we check on the energy use and calculate the mechanization status. Okay? And you can see that for rice, it's only 0 0.59, very low in Malaysia. Okay? Very low. Rice is under cereal, the average is 0 0.77, but in Malaysia it's only 0 0.59. But in some countries like Japan, Korea, they are almost reached to 1 or 100% recognized. And we are a bit ashamed to our neighbour, Thailand, who has achieved to 90%. Okay. So we check on the mechanization status for various field operation, and we are trying to see what are the critical operation. That, and the three critical operation is spraying, fertilizing, seed broadcasting. So uh, they, they are about 0 0.19 to 0 0.24. And this is where focus should be paid in trying to mechanize our rice production. Okay? Harvesting is very high, but again, doesn't mean that harvesting is fully mechanized. We have to stop from there. Okay, we have to sort of further improve, check whether do we have the quality that we want in using the current uh, uh, combined harvester. And that is why now DOA is trying to introduce a new mid-size combine, and we were involved with trying to check on the quality of using mid-size Combined. I think I have that data in my book, and you can refer that in the paper that we publish. Okay. Okay. Going to rice. Why are we 0 0.59? If you talk about machinery packages for rice, you can easily get that from Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and in fact from from Thailand. And if you look at the field operation. Fertilizer, spraying, these are all standard, simple operation. Why are we very low in terms of our mechanization status? So that is the question that we have to ask. And then that is the question that the department has to look upon. Mechanization for rice is straightforward. We have all those chef machinery and use it for our field. And we are very happy that the infrastructure is there and then it's easy for us to mechanize that. Oil palm, okay? our golden fruits. Mechanization index is only 0 0.43. Okay? And what are the critical operations in oil palm? The three critical operations in oil palm is in field loose collection. It's almost zero. We are totally depends on human labor.
to mechanize that. That's why I told you, my son and my daughter won't work in an opang if you call them to work. <laughs> okay? FFB harvesting is about 0.09 and then pest control is 0.08. And these are the three serious operations that we have to mechanize. Well, compared to, compared to rice and oil palm, I think it's okay a bit, simply because we don't have off-shelf machinery that we can use in oil palm, because it deals with different set of machinery. Rice is okay, a lot of people uh, plant rice, and then we can easily buy that. But in oil palm, we have to develop our own machinery. Okay? So 0 0.43 is very low. Then sweet corn. I was involved with this sweet corn simply because I was shocked to see that some of, some of our rice plot in Malaysia has been converted into sweet corn plot. Okay? So knowing that, I have one of my st students okay, check on the energy use and trying to know why these farmers are planting sweet corn in the land that is supposedly gazetted for rice. Okay? Well, sweet corn is 0 0.34 less, very low. Again, shouldn't be that low because of we can easily import those machinery. Sweet corn is a standard crops. So we have these machinery packages for sweet corn. So we were surprised why the farmers don't mechanize that. But could be it's just a small farmers. And then from the studies that we have done, we came to know that the cost-benefit ratio of planting sweet corn in a rice plot is very much more than planting rice. I think this farmer is a very clever farmer. And then after the, the research work, I talked to him and then they just smiled to me. Okay? So, if the rice farmer are planting sweet corn, they are better well off than planting rice. Well, we'll forget about that then. Okay, and then we, uh, we do a thorough energy study okay, on these three crops. This is what I'm, I, I would like to summarize and highlight. Okay? With respect to energy sources, you compare in terms of total energy, for seed corn, it's very high. We use a lot of energy, okay, compared to wetland rice, okay. And then with the component of energy, we use a lot of fertilizer energy in seed corn and rice, okay. So, uh, again, side time for us to check whether are we going, are we optimizing the use of fertilizer in sweet corn or rice production. Well, if you go to oil palm, the highest amount of energy that is used in machinery, okay, surprisingly, you know, they, they have a lot of energy used in machinery, but when you talk about mechanization index, it's very low, 0 0.49, okay? I check on that. They use a lot of heavy machinery, very expensive heavy machinery, during land preparation, they use and during the uh, land clearing operation. Okay, so these machinery are very expensive. They have a bulldozer, they have crawlers, they have a uh, backhoe to chop the uh, to chop the, the trunks, and that is why the machinery engine energy is rise. It is not distributed throughout the operation. If you go and see on spraying, they still have a man tossing the fertilizer on the plant to some estate, okay? So it is more heavy on the land clearing operation, but not distributed with other operation. And of course, in main, mainland transportation, bringing the FFV to the farm, uh, to, the, to the mill also, they use heavy machinery, tractors, lorry, eh? and that is also one of the reasons why the machinery energy is very high, okay? And then after that, fertilizer is also high, okay? Right after that, and fertilizer is also high. Okay? That is the scenario about our oil palm, rice, and sweet corn cultivation in Malaysia. 
Let me go through this law of machine. A lot of people don't know about law of machine. They are involved in designing and construct, uh, constructing machine. Okay? I want to go through these three important law of machine. Okay, this law of machine are being formulated by my former major professor, late major professor, Professor Vesley F. Buckley from Iowa State. Okay? He's a very famous professor in machinery. So the law was not universally known or understood, and as a result today, there exists enormous technological difference between countries. We engineers, we are very familiar with Newton law of motion. Am I right, students? We use that in our designing work, trying to draw the free body diagram, and we use that three Newton law okay, of motion. But we are not very familiar with this law of machine. Let me go through this law of machine. The first law says that any operation performed by hand, human hand, can be performed by a machine or a series of machines. So meaning to say that we can do machine easily. But, says that, machine can develop to replace human hand in any agriculture operation. However, the machine is of little use in operation, should not be developed. Okay? Because the profit from the sales would not support the cost of the design development and manufacturing. Meaning to say that it's good enough to, get, to use end. Okay? And in fact, in some machine you can see, some planters, you can see a tractor and implement, and then we have people at the back to do the planting operation. Why don't we have a mechanism to do that? Simply because it's not necessary. It's fast enough for a human to do that. Rather to have a mechanism that do the planting operation. Okay? And it might add to the cost of the machine. Second law of machine says that any operation performed by a machine or a series of machines can be done faster or cheaper with the improvement in the quality of the product by another machine or a series of machines. So there is an evolution involved that we have to understand. So, bear in mind that during the initial introduction of the machine, we don't expect that machine to be 100% perfect. I want to remind to most of the plantation managers, no? <laughs> whenever we show the products of our machine, they want wonders. They want an ideal machine. I think that is not a good sort of strategy for us in Malaysia. Let's start with that first and use that and then from there we improve on the design. Okay? And you can see that practice until today people still redesign and improve on the design of tractors even though tractors were first introduced in 1928. Okay? So the progress and evolution need to be there. Okay? But of course before you can introduce it, the new technology, there are two things that you have to fulfill. I will come to that later, the two important things that you have to fulfill. Okay? Third law. Okay? Third law says that any uncontrolled mechanized profitable produce or product will be overproduction. Okay? So we have to remember that we have to control on the use of machine so that there is no overproduction because sooner or later it won't justify the use of this machine. Okay? That are the three laws and then I will sort of uh, elaborate that letter as we go along the lectures. No? The two important things that we have to answer okay? before any machine or new technology that we want to introduce. Okay? I think those designers, machine designers, eh? okay, and then man, uh, machine manufacturers and machine uh, uh, sellers, eh? whenever you want to sell your machine, two things that you have in mind. One, is the new machine or technology more productive 
better capacity than the current machine? That is one question. If you cannot fulfill that, forget about that. Okay. So meaning to say that you have to benchmark your machine. The current technology, what is the field capacity? And then when you test your machine, what is the field capacity of the machine? If you cannot justify that, forget about that. That, that is the first question. The second question is the cost of operating the new machine or technology cheaper than that of the current machine or technology? The next step, we come to the cost. You need to know the current technology. What is the cost of operation? Dollars per hour. And then what is the cost of your new machine? Dollars per hour. Again, if you cannot fulfill the second question, forget about that. Okay? Because at the end, these two things matters. Because in agriculture, it's different from other fields. Okay? We have to play around with the cost. I think we have our friend here from oil palm. They have said the cost of field operation in oil palm, that is much. We cannot go more than that because if not, we are not going to make profit. Okay? So people who are designing that, first of all, benchmark your technology first before you want to introduce in the market. Okay? This is what it means by productivity. Okay? We are talking about areas and time. From there, you can know hectares per hour. And then this is what we call has fee operation. You have to go through calculating the fee operation, depreciation, tax, shelter, insurance, interest, fuel, lubricant, uh, repair, maintenance, and labor, and plus others to get the machinery cost. Any of my students who do PhD with me, they have to do this. Okay? They cannot sort of stop just by having the functionality of the machine, but they have to complete to that extent because we are trying to benchmark our technology that we develop with the current that is used in the plantation. Okay, harvesting of oil palm. Okay, you know that harvesting of oil palm using pole and sickle. A lot of people have tried various ways of harvesting oil palm, but this is still the best. So let me tell you, okay, harvesting of oil palm. We have done motion study of all operation, right from planting until harvesting, until transport, uh, transportation. We know that the tasks involved for each operation. I have a data of that because these are important if you are a designer okay, for fishing. Let me show for you for this oil palm because oil, oil palm harvesting is a very serious problem. Okay, the tasks involved in oil palm Start with pruning the fawn, then cutting the bunch, cut the bunch, and then take the cut from, lay that aside at the proper place, and then take the bunch that you cut on the ground and put that beside the machine path. And then after that, you have to walk to the next farm. And these are the time duration that you have to fulfill. Cutting of farm prawn it's just about one minute. Cutting the bunch, half a minute. Arranging the palm front is about half a minute. Transferring, transferring the cut bunch is about 60 sec 16 seconds. Walking about slightly more than one minute. And the total time is about slightly not more than three minutes. You have only three minutes to complete one pump to harvest. And if you want to have a machine or a robot, make sure that it is less than three minutes. That is a challenge. If it cannot be less than three minutes, forget about that. You don't answer the first question. Is the capacity enough or not for you to compete with the current one? Again, the cost of operating with the current one using a pole and sickle is only five ringgit and 50 cents per hour. If you have the gadget or the machine that you want, make sure that it cannot be more than five ringgit and 50 minutes per hour. Again, you won't answer the second question. So bear, bear in mind, researcher, please benchmark. You have to know the actual problems, okay? 
Don't be. I used to say to my student, don't be uh, what we call that rocket scientist, lecture, uh, uh, researchers. Okay, don't be Einstein just to sit on your ro in your room and then try to design machine. You have to go down and check what is the real happening in the field. People talk about robot. Can robot use to harvest oil palm bunches? Okay. I was there in 1993 to attend this symposium on fruit, nuts, and vegetables. I think Dr. No is with me. Remember that, Dr. No? We were together in Spain, eh? <laughs> okay. attending this uh, seminar. And then th there is a show of a robot by Simograph from France. There is a lot of work done by Simograph in France during that time. Simograph is just like Marley, okay? And there is one person uh, who is a robot man from University of California, Davis, but this man has passed away already, okay? Who developed that research on citrus harvesting. And they show us in the symposium. That was about 26 years ago, okay? I have my friend from University of California, uh, University of Florida, came to visit us, Professor Schuller, and I asked him, Citru uh, uh, Florida is known to be the production of citrus in the world. And I asked him, how do they harvest citrus? They say it's still by manually, by men. Okay? And then I told him, what happened to robots? People are talking about robots. No. It's just research and research, okay? So again, I think we have to adjust ourselves whenever we want to do research, okay? Because research in agriculture is solving real problems in the field, okay? So we have to make sure the money that we spend is justifiable for the farmers and then for the plantation. So you can answer now. Can we beat that if we want to use robot to harvest? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let me go through on the proper uh, lecture now. What is important when you talk about quality and quantity in operation of your machine? The first thing that you have to justify is the power of your prime mover. Your prime mover has to have enough power so that you can have the capacity that you want to have in your operation and to have the quality of operation. Okay? They have these two extremes, oversized and undersized prime mover. If your prime mover is oversized, you are spending a lot of your power and trying to maneuver your small equipment at the back, it might cost you. And then at the same time, it's difficult to maneuver the implement at the back because the tractor is too big at the front. And then again, you won't get the quality of operation. If you're talking about undersized prime mover, the tractor is too small, but the machine is too big. It won't be a smooth operation of your tractor and your implements in the field because it might be breakdown, your machine cannot operate properly, and again, it will, you don't have the capacity, and then furthermore, you won't have the quality of operation. So the most important thing whenever you want to mechanize is the power of your prime mover. Okay? And I've done a lot of work on the power of the prime mover. A lot of us here, I noticed that in the plantation, they know that track machine is very good, especially on soft ground. They just simply import any track vehicle and then run that in the, in the uh, soft ground. And they realize that the machine doesn't last that long, simply because they don't have enough power to run. They never check on what is the capacity of the power for that track vehicle to move on the ground. Okay, they just simply use that. So uh, we have done a lot of work, of course, through my uh, effort of my graded students. 
So when you talk about power, there are two types of uh, tractor or prime mover. One is a tractor, say for example, with a plow, and then the other one, a tractor with the implement and with all those functional equipment that they have. Okay? So when you want to know the engine power, okay, for a tractor, say for example, a tractor with a gravel arm, with a trailer, you need to know the power, first of all, for the gravel to operate, and this is quite easy. Okay? You know what is the weight to lift, what is, what is the speed line, you can roughly know what is the pump capacity that you need. Okay? And then, you need to know what is the power to pull the trailer, trailer behind. And then, finally, you need, the, you need to know the tyre power. Okay? Because tyre power depends on the terrain condition and then plus the weight of the prime mover. Okay? If you are talking about plow, okay? There are two things of power, uh, power that you need to know. One is, of course, the tyre power, and the other one is the tillage power that you have to know. And from there, you know what will be the optimum power of your tractor or the prime mover that you want to use or that you want to design. Okay, uh, we have uh, done fun fundamental work on trying to know what will be the tyre power, okay, of course, uh, these are the basic uh, tyre, soil, uh, forces diagram. So what we are interested is on the top, on the motion, res on the, on the, on the motion resistance, on the slippage, on the speed. Huh? So these are the typical force diagram of a tyre. One is unpowered tyre, one is powered tyre. We need to know that. Huh? And then we want to know, finally what we want to know is the motion resistance, the, uh, what we call that, the, 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 the top and plus others. We have developed this, uh, uh, what we call that, uh, UPM indoor tyre testing facilities. Okay. In 1993, of course, with the help of uh, one professor, Professor Hetarachi, from University of uh, Newcastle upon time, he came and helped us in trying to design and then, but we finally uh, sort of construct that. And then, in fact, uh, all the instrumentation is uh, through our, uh, from our own uh, design and selection. Okay? So these are the uh, uh, UPM indoor tire testing facilities, the very good facilities that we have during that time. Okay? And then we have to move to our new facilities here. We have to dismantle that saw sort of tire testing. We have done a lot of work. I've published quite a lot in General of Tara Mechanics on that work of tyre with my student and not me, myself alone. And then after that, we, we have to dismantle the facilities and then we move to the new facilities here and we never build up that again simply because we don't have allocation to build up. Then in 1988, I start to build up again this uh, uh, UPM indoor tyre testing in the hope of trying to revive back this tyre mechanics uh, work. Simply because I was in Iowa State last year, okay? and then in Iowa State, they started to build up their tyre testing facilities with the grant that they have from tractor companies. Caterpillars, John Deere, and plus others. Because what they told me now, in agriculture machinery or in tractor, the focus is now on tyre. Because a lot of power is lost at the tyre, about 20 to 50 percent okay, of power loss at the tyre. And now they are putting money on research on tyre. And then they have a new concept of tyre. So, Normal tyre is, you can see the lugs just underneath the circumference of the tyre, but now they go to the wall of the tyre, okay, trying to help to develop the traction. Okay? That will be the trend next time. And then they will have a, what they call that inflation tyre pressure system in the tractor. Meaning to say that they control 
the air pressure in the tyre and then taking the advantage of the terrain to get the traction. So, meaning to say that if they are in soft soil, they start to flatten the pressure and then they get better traction. When they are on road, they increase the, the pressure and the tyre will uh, sort of uh, increase the diameter and then they get better traction on concrete and on road. So, there is uh, a big research now on these tyre studies and we started that in UPM to build up these facilities and I have one PhD student currently working with me on this uh, tyre hoping that we can uh, sort of produce something out of that. So these are the results that we have earlier on the tyre motion resistance, slippage, traction from the test that we have before. Okay, from there we can know what is the, what is the uh, top that we need for the tyre and what are the motion resistance and plus others. Uh. And then we also uh, use the method of finite element. My current uh, students, they are trying to compare with uh, empirical methods and uh, numerical methods and trying to mesh whether how close is that. Okay? So we used uh, Abacos uh, 3D finite element methods to stimulate the motion of the tyre and predict the performance and compare that with the test that we are going to do with our facilities later. Okay? And uh, these are some of the findings that we have. We managed to get the tyre motion resistance equation tire top and plus others. Okay? I won't go to the detail and then you can sort of uh, read from the text or refer to my journal. Okay? Okay. The other power that we want to know, we refer to power, tillage power, power from the implement. Okay? So we need to have facilities also to measure this power. So we were involved also last time on trying to instrument a tractor with all those measurement sensors okay, in real time to measure torque, fuel consumption, slippage, and various other things. It's a very complete instrumentation that we have on the tractor and of course with a GPS. Okay? And then we use this instrumentation to develop what we call that the draft, the, draft, the draft power of the common implement that we have in Malaysia. I think that can be a standard to everybody. We, so far, we don't have that draft equation yet. Okay? And we have developed that. Okay? And then these are the draft equation. Because we need to know what are the draft equation if you want to know what will be the power for the tractor to run with that implement. Okay? And uh, again, it's already published also in a journal, and people can refer that. In fact, in Asabe, they have this standard on the draft equation for their soil. Okay? But in Malaysia, we don't have that standard. It's just you can refer to the journal okay, that we have published. So from there, with the tractor power and then with the draft power, we determine the engine capacity. So we develop an algorithm to identify what will be the uh, engine capacity of our machine if we want to design that. Okay. Through this, what we call that uh, the, the motion equation that we have. Okay. And uh, manage to produce a chart. Okay. To produce a chart to know what will be the power that you need for your prime mover. But the, the algorithm that we did is only for prime mover that is self-contained, meaning to say that they, they don't have a drawbar power at the back. Everything is on the machine, machine chas chassis. Say, for example, a transporter. Okay? So uh, we have this chart okay, for six wheel and four wheel. And then from this chart, you can determine what will be the engine power that is needed based on the slope and various other things. Or if your machine is with different specification, you can use the algorithm to determine the power that you need. I think 
our manufacturer in Malaysia don't do this. They just simply know the engine power just through experience. And they might be overpowered or it might be underpowered. Besides on wheel, we also work on track vehicle, okay? Because track is very common also. I have one of my PhD students. He's now a professor at UIA, very uh, productive professor, one of the productive professors in mechanical engineering at UIA. He has done a lot with me on trying to uh, sort of develop an algorithm to uh, sort of identify the power for a track machine. We have a lot of track machine in, in oil pump, especially in Sabah and Sarawak. They use a lot of this track machine. And if you visit the plantation, you can see that a lot of them are dismantled and then they buy a new one. Eh? After four years, they throw it away and then they buy another new one. Eh? I don't know for what reason. Could be because of the power is not enough. And then that is why uh, the machine cannot last that long okay, for the operation. Eh? So we have this, okay? And then I don't want to go through that also. You can refer to my book on how we calculate that and refer to the journal that we produce on how we can calculate what will be the power that we need for a track machine. Okay? Then, we move forward from there. And then, we have already a prime mover. We know what is the power that we need for our prime mover. Let's go to the operation. So we introduced this, what we call that mechanization in totality, totality concept for oil pump. Because we feel that tractor is not the best prime mover for, plant, for, for, for three crops. Actually, tractor is only for cash crop or row crops. Okay? For three crops, you cannot use tractor. If you use tractor, it's good enough for transportation. Because you cannot have a machinery to build up on the tractor. If you want to have a machinery, it becomes a two unit. When it is two unit, it won't be that effective. You might lose the capacity. So we need to have a prime mover for oil pump. So what we have is a concept, we call it a universal prime mover. Okay, simple concept. And then we have machinery attachment on the prime mover to run the various operation in oil pump. Okay. So name me what operation you want. Let's say for FFB picker, so we have the attachment for FFB. Uh, FFB picking, we have uh, attachment for FFB picking. For circle spraying, we have that. For transplanting, we have that, and plus others. Okay. Uh, the power that we use for this prime mover is based on our algorithm that we have developed, knowing what is the best power, and then we manage to, have to, to select what will be the best engine. So the main concept that we, we call it mechanization in totality, it is more of holistic approach, meaning to say that, okay, I'm going to solve this mechanization problem in the oil pump. So let's determine what will be the price, uh, prime mover, forget about what we have in the market, and then start to build up everything in a holistic picture of trying to mechanize oil pump. Okay? And then, of course, it has to economical, justify, simple, practical, flexible, reliable, and then maneuverability it should be very good. Okay? We all consider that. Self-contained, everything is in the very self-contained, not two units, self-contained, completely integrated, one-man operation if possible, and then it's continuous over operation. We need to say that it should keep on continuous without any stopping. So this is a concept that we, we want okay, in our idea of introducing uh, mechanization in totality. And then, well, we have produced the prototype, and then uh, we have do the uh, sort of testing, okay, and get the fuel capacity, and then compare that with the current system, and it looks very good. Of course, these are prototype. There's a lot more that you have to improve, okay? And say, for example, for soil filling operation in polybags, our new system can produce about 198 polybags per hour. The current common system is only 155. So an increase of about 31%. Seedling transplanting, planting of, planting of uh, seedling in the plantation, if you see currently, they are staggered. 
they start drilling a hole, drill first, and then after that, another day they come with the uh, seedling, start to uh, allocate the seedling, put that, everything, and then again, one week after that, come another gang of people, start to plant that. Eh? But what we have in mind is a continuous operation. Drill that, and then put the ceiling and cover that in one continuous operation. Okay? And we compare that. Okay? Ours is about 0.75 hectare per main day, but the current method is 0.65, but it's staggered. Remember, it's staggered. Eh? And then we have uh, blanket spraying, we have circle spraying, we have fertilizing, we have infill collection and transportation. That is so far that we have gone. I don't do any harvesting work throughout my life because to me, pole and sickle is still the fastest. I don't want to spend my time okay, trying to, <laughs> to, uh, uh, to, to waste my effort of trying to beat that capacity. It's difficult for me. So I leave that aside. To me, I think using pole and sickle is still the best. Okay? I don't know. It could be now there are people who have new ideas on trying to mechanize that. Okay. Uh, next, another project that we have is on variable rate granular fertilizer application. Okay. I think this is uh, where we want to apply fertilizer at the right amount, at the right place in the field. Okay? So we come to a concept of having this, we call it a variable rate fertilizer applicator that uses RFID technology. We are not using GPS because you know if you are in a plantation, because of the coverage, you cannot get GPS signal because of the uh, coverage of the front. You cannot get easy access of the GPS signals. So uh, if we can get access, it's easy for us. So what we use is the RFID technology. So what we have is we have a reader, and then we have to put tag on the pump so that we can know the position and then apply the fertilizer at the right amount. Okay? Again, the concept is these are the standard pump layout. We have this machine path in the middle, then we have rows of pump, left and right, and then after that we have the front laid in straight rows at the side. The standard operating procedure is whenever you want to apply fertilizer, apply fertilizer along the row of the front. So the standard practice is we have a man carrying a bag of fertilizer and start to toss the fertilizer. Not at the circumference of the trunk, but at the row of the front. Why is that like that? Simply because of the fertilizer will stay there. It won't be washed up by the water during rainy seasons. It will be there, retained. And then the, the palm it says they have fibrous root. The fibrous root can go to the fertilizer. Okay? So uh, the standard is to put the fertilizer on the row. Okay? So we have to apply fertilizer on the row. We cannot dig the ground and lay the fertilizer and then close that. You know why? Because according to the plantation manager, if you start to touch the soil, dig the soil, it will affect the growth of the palm, and then it might sort of effect on the production of bunches. You cannot touch the ground. So that's why they have to still apply the fertilizer on the surface, and you have to make sure that it won't be washed out. So this is what we have. We have, uh, okay, we use our prime mover that we have, and then we have this fertilizer attachment on the prime mover, and we shoot the fertilizer so that it falls on the row of pond that we laid at both sides. Okay, and we have a control system that adjusts how much that we have to apply, real time, okay, and then uh, according to the amount that we, have, we want to apply, and then there is a feedback system to measure the speed of our prime mover and check whether we are applying at the right amount. Okay? 
So I don't want to go to that detail also. Okay? So this is where we, 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 we check on the output of the fertilizer to see whether our uh, metering system accurately uh, sort of deliver the amount of fertilizer that we want. And it's very good in a sense, left and right. We check on the distribution so that it will fall on the front area and to see how is the coverage like. So we run that in the field, stimulate that. And you can see that it's just that is the front, uh, front on the sides. It's just covered along the front area. Okay? It's good enough to cover that. And then we check on how it responds, how fast it responds with the cut. Okay? Once the reader detects the cut, you want to see how it detect, how fast it detect, okay? And then we check when we have different orientation of application rate. And then the lag time is not that big, it's about two to three seconds, which is good enough, okay? So meaning to say that system, they can apply fertilizer according to the pump that, uh, that we want to apply. For that pump, how much you apply? When we move our machine, it detect that and start to apply the amount that we want for the pump. Okay? So before that, we have to know how much we have to apply. That is uh, routine work made by the plantation. Normally, they will determine what is the application rate in the field. Or at times, we might just apply that by having two tags, one in front and one at the back. So we are, we are not varying the fertilizer application according to the pump, but we are varying the fertilizer application according to the row of pump. It's okay, that can be done. We can program that in our system. Okay, and that is our field capacity, and it's working properly. Then we are happy, and then I think there's a company who are interested on this system, and we are signing an MOA for that soon. Okay. Then, on top of that, we also do works on yield monitor monitoring okay, for PD trying to know the variability of the yield within a plot. This is also important. Okay? Yield monitoring is a standard in most combined harvester in America. Okay? But in Malaysia, we don't have that. Okay? So uh, what we have is we want to have a system while the combine is harvesting the plot, we are able to know what is the yield like within that area. And with that information, with the position that we know, we are able to plot the yield. And that is a yield map. With the yield map that we have, we know which place has the highest yield, which place in the plot that has lower yield, and then we can use the, this information later to plan our fertilizer application program in the next season. Okay? So having the yield map is very important. So uh, we... We were involved earlier with a very complicated system, okay? And then it's working, but very complicated because we have in installed the system on the combined harvester. Very complicated. And then somebody approached to me that, why don't we have a portable system so we can just move the system to another combine whenever we want? So these are simple systems that we have. And in fact, other than that, we improve the sensor to measure the yield and moisture content. So what we have is, these are the combined harvester, then we measure the width instantaneously, and then as the grain is being uh, harvested, before it goes to the collection tank on the combined harvester, we measure the flow rate, and then we measure the uh, moisture content. And then the driver there can, shoot, can see what is the flow rate like and what is the moisture content, what are the speed like and every, every other things. And then we have an operator on the ground. The information will be transferred real time. And then we have the operator on the ground and then he's also, she's also monitoring on that. So I have two good students doing on this project. One is one Korean student, started with that, a lady. Then after that, we have one Indonesian student okay, working with me for that. Okay, these are the sort of yield map that we have. Very informative information. 
okay, that we need. Okay? Uh, the one that I show you here on the screen is the process signal, is the process uh, data. You know, because the, the signal I'm measuring at every second, so we have to take average and various other things. And then we process that and we draw the map. And then on, before when you run the test also, we do cut, uh, cut, what we call crop cut test. Before we run the machine, we go into the field and then take uh, the yield at one meter square and then collect the yield and try to plot that. So that we want to compare the uh, estimated yield with the yield that we use with our system. And this is what we have. It's almost the same. Almost the same. The pattern is there from the uh, uh, crop cut test and from our uh, system that we measure the, the yield. Okay? Uh, and then, of course, uh, I think uh, I have to stop now. <laughs> uh, that is a part of the research that I want to share with you. Okay? Of course, putting things go together is a challenge for me also. Okay, uh, I have been involved in uh, research in oil palm and then rice and then to put that into a presentation I think is a big challenge. Yeah? I have to skip some of them because I don't do only this research. There are other research that, that I did also. And uh, I used to tell my friend, okay, to give a lecture like this is quite challenging if you are about to retire. <laughs> In a matter that putting things in order, I think I used to talk to Prof Rashid. <laughs> he's, my, <laughs> he's my friend. If, if you are a singer, if you want to retire, it's good enough you take all your songs, compile that together, and produce an album, all the greatest hit. Okay. I wish, being a lecturer, so we can do that. Took our best paper, put that together, and publish that. But we cannot do that. We have to put into a story and produce a book like that. Okay? So thank you very much, everybody, uh, for uh, having time to listen with my presentation. And thank you.
Thank you very much, Yang Bahagia Professor Dr. Azmi Yahya for the outstanding presentation. Um, isn't it inspiring? Yes. yes. Let's give him a round of applause. I think uh, from the presentation, uh, it is clear that uh, Prof. Azmi and the team has been working so hard. And uh, there are lots of things that uh, I myself have learned about it. And, uh, and uh, I can see the, the passion um, of uh, Prof. Azmi uh, in this particular area is what you can see from all the presentations, all the work, systematic work that he has conducted. Uh, and uh, as uh, somebody working in electronics engineering to look from different angle um, of how we should be doing uh, our machineries in the future, uh, I think we should nurture more of multidisciplinary um, research uh, so that uh, researchers from different areas can understand the requirement from uh, other researchers. And um, from that angle, I think um, we at University of Putra Malaysia, um, we have that advantage because we are working um, as one faculty. We have eight departments of uh, engineering working under one faculty and uh, more collaboration can be done much easier as compared to uh, being in uh, different faculties. On behalf of the university, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate again uh, Yang Bagi Professor Dr. Azmi Yahya uh, for all the significant achievements that uh, he has made throughout uh, his career. Uh, and all the contributions, especially in research, professional services, as well as his leadership in driving uh, the management of the uh, Faculty of Engineering previously when he was the Dean uh, towards Greater Heights as well as I think mentoring lots of um, young academics yeah, for us, me, yeah, in the department as well as in the, in the faculty. Um, and uh, we wish you all the success uh, in the future and uh, I hope to see all of you again in the next inaugural. With that, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Thank you to Yang Berbahagia Professor Technologist Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Saripan for chairing the event and thank you by thank you to Yang Berbahagia Professor Engineer Dr. Azmi Yahya for delivering his lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, it marks the end of our session today. We would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude and appreciation to everyone with us today for the support and contribution in making this event a great success. Before that, I would like to invite all to come to the center to the hall, and ha uh, we will have a photography session with our guests of honor, please. I would like to invite all to come to the center, and we have a photography uh, session with our VIPs. <laughs>